thousand foot pounds is nothing to nothing to joke with. I mean, in most recommendations, most calibers have to meet that as a minimum to even be allowed to hunt with them. Mm-hmm. listening to the muzzleloaders podcast the show where we talk about anything and everything black powder how's it going guys welcome back to another episode of the muzzleloaders podcast Uh, i am thrilled to be joined with colton again colton works on our customer service team and uh, odds are if you're talking to somebody on the phone you're probably talking to colton so uh, (laughs) now you have a face to go with the uh, face to go with the voice if you guys have talked to him so uh, but today we're going to be talking about load development we were recently on the range doing load development with the uh, CV Accurate LRX, and um, we had two days. So we had the first day. The first day was our ladder test, and that was with uh, Emilio. And basically, we started with 70 grains by weight, 77, 84, 91, 98, and 105, all of those weight measurements uh, with Pyrodex Select. And so, um, actually, before I get before I get too carried away in all this stuff, how are you doing today, Cold? <laughs> In- introduce yourself. Say something. I, I'm great today. It's a beautiful Wednesday morning. I'd much rather be up at the range, but <laughs> that's true. That's true. But we're podcasting, so it can't. It's not that bad. No, it's not, it's bad. not bad at all. But <laughs> anytime I have a chance to get a gun in my hands, I will take that opportunity. Yes, totally. I totally agree. Especially when uh, you know it's a muzzle loader. At least for mm-hmm. me. At least for me. Hey, 50 caliber. That's right. That's right. Doesn't get much better. Um. So yeah. So back to the. Back to the the test, and the I'm gonna data. yeah, I'm gonna lay this out probably in a little bit more clear way for everyone, so that I'm not just like laser focused on what I'm doing. So we had two days. We had day one, we did the ladder test. Day two was more fine tuning the load that we found that worked. So day one, we did uh, we mi- we had a Pyrodex select. We went, measured it by weight, and we had a Federal 29A primer. We had the Burris RT25 scope. Um, the 50 caliber version of the CVA Accurate LRX. And we had, uh, day one, we shot the Thor hammers. Day two, we shot the Thor lightnings. Um, Same grain weight and everything, just a little bit different design in the bullet. Uh, The hammers are custom fit and the lightnings are one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Which I would like to add, uh I I was impressed with how easily they loaded into the CVA guns. Oh, totally. I think Mm -hmm. that's the cool thing about the lightnings is they... Um, like once you, like to get them started is a little tough because the, the skirt is oversized, but as soon as you get them started, they load perfectly every time. And it's very, uh, very, uh, consistent fit. I had no issues one handed yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Loading seriously. Them. Yeah. They were awesome. They're a great bullet. Um, and so day one was a little bit of a, a fiasco because we uh, had a ton of weather issues. So it would go from sunny to cold and snowing and windy back to sunny, back to cold, snowing, windy. Um, and so, and yeah, I don't think it really got above, I don't think it got much above freezing the whole day. It was one of the coldest range days I've ever done consistently cold. Um, and so, but we were able to at least get the ladder test done. So we determined that 105 by weight is the, the best charge for this particular setup. And that's going to be different for every muzzleloader. And just to be clear, that's 105 by weight of Pyrodex Select. If you're using Blackhorn, um, I believe, yeah, 84 by weight is yep. going to be your maximum That's charge. Correct. So, uh, but 105 by weight of Pyrodex Select was the charge for this particular gun. And so settled on that. We decided to pack it in. We headed home. Um, and then we came back with Colton and we did a little more fine tuning with the 105 by weight charge. And um, we were able to determine some pretty interesting things. Uh, the, so uh, Colton, you want to go through the standard deviation numbers real quick for all of those um <laughs> all those different charges first before we get too far? I'd be happy to. Our standard deviation was, well, pretty high, I thought. Yeah. Uh, We definitely noticed that a lot of the environmental factors played into it, specifically our seating depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) That was a really important one. But to get started with our 77 grains by weight uh, measurement, we had a standard deviation of 67.6, followed by our 84 grain by weight test, which was a 57 standard deviation. That was a pretty good one. That was one of our better ones. Yeah. Uh, our 91 uh, grains by weight uh, came out to 89.3. Our 98 grain by weight came to 130.8. Uh, 
Did a lot of measurements on that yeah, one. That was a that was all over the place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, all sorts of factors play into muzzle loading. Seriously. Our 105 grains by weight, which did turn out, as you said, to be one of the better shooting charges for the 50 cal LRX. Mm-hmm. Uh, standard deviation came out to 79.9 on that one. Yeah, and I think that that one one key note there is we shot more shots with the 105 by weight than we did with any of the other ones, and mm. so. Um, you, we would have strings of several that were really, really close, and then you'd have some, like, random one. And so a 79.9, I think, is pretty good. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. 50 is usually the goal, um, but I think that after discovering what we discovered uh, with the seating depth, and um, because in this particular instance, I, I've always known that keeping your seating depth consistent, like your packing consistent, is very important. Uh, but I didn't realize exactly how important it is because – uh, even just the smallest difference um, is is, is going to make a huge difference in your velocity from shot to shot, uh, and yeah, so quite a bit. Yeah, I think I think that that number could even be dropped down more because we figured that out more towards the end of the range day, and it was like, oh man, well now it's pretty much over. So it was an eighth to a sixteenth of a measurement. Yeah, on the rod, it, it was pretty minor, but it was enough to move our velocities all over the place. Yeah, and I think the the reasoning for that is when it's more compact, it changes how the powder burns and how the, um, how basically your spark is not able to travel as easily from kernel to kernel mm. and ignite the powder. And so it's it, not, not that either way is, is bad. You just want to make sure that your packing is consistent from shot to shot because it's going to mm. change how it works. Um, and so you just want to make sure it's firm. Once you make sure you've, you've got it to where it's uh you know it's seated you can mark your ramrod with tape or with uh, a sharpie a i've even yeah i've used my leatherman to um scuff it to scuff it a little bit uh the tough the tough thing with that is if you're shooting a dirty powder like pyrodex select is it starts to cover that up with just mm. the grime um but yeah i think those standard deviation numbers i'm not like overly concerned about that because the grouping with the 105 once we got it figured out was pretty good yeah yeah, I felt pretty consistent with the shooting those charges. Yeah, yeah, and I think that because we shot, we had the our, our final group at 100 when we got when we got it zeroed with the 105 by weight was, um, it was like we had two that were right in almost in the, like in this just right next to each other uh, at zero, and then we had one that was kind of more off to the side by like an inch, and so it was a really tight group, um, but uh, it's, you know, just one of those things you always it seems like seems like for me the third shot i get inside my own head and i can never like it's like i have two right next to each other and it's like okay i've got to do this one right i got to get it right there and then like something happens and it's, it just kind of goes to the off to the side but oh we shoot better cold board yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly yeah um so colton why don't you talk a little bit about our 300 yard experience oh, boy well shooting out to 300 yards with the 50 cal lrx is completely doable mm-hmm. and we'll start off by saying that it does uh take a lot of precision uh going into that and one of the biggest things we noticed was the environmental factors played much more of a role in uh, the accuracy that we noticed downrange at 300 yards. <clears throat> Even the slightest headwind of, say, I think we had a five mile an hour headwind, uh, if that, mm-hmm. that's being generous, was enough to move us about 14 inches yeah. around on the paper. We were still on our paper, uh, but you would be, you know, with a change of the breeze, you could be 14 inches off from your last shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, while it is doable, uh, I definitely would creep in closer to an animal yeah. if I found something at 300 yards. Definitely, if possible, yeah. And mm-hmm. I think that uh, what I've determined, and um, we'll we'll throw the so I was able to get on the Hornady ballistic calculator, and it's not it's never perfect because the drag function is not exact to the uh, to the bullet that we're using. Uh, I use G1 drag function because that's the closest, uh, which it, it's not. Exact. So if you're going to be doing that, you can use ballistic calculators to help you get close, but you're definitely going to want to make sure you're testing out those, uh, that information before you take it out into the field, because it's more than likely not going to be a hundred percent accurate. Um, Mm. but according to that, about five miles per hour of wind, one direction or the other, uh, is roughly a mill of adjustment. And so we were using an MRAD scope and, uh, a mill, out at that distance is is very significant i mean like colton said it's you know right right in the the vicinity of like a foot um and so basically if you're off by a couple even three miles per hour you could be off by 
you know, six inches. And so heart shot to a spine shot. Yeah, seriously. And so you want to make sure that, uh, you know, your wind, we actually, uh, picked up a wind, a wind checker, which that gives you one area of wind. So you have, um, I actually just learned this from Nate the other day, but you have three different areas that you need to measure your wind. So you have the wind at, at the muzzle, then you have wind at mid distance and wind at the target. And, um, that is for long range shooting at 300 yards. The wind is probably going to be a little bit closer to consistent. You're probably going to have a generally the same wind where you're at, at, you know, as same as it is 300 yards away, but still, um, being able to be accurate with that me- measurement is going to make all the world of difference. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Getting all of your environmental factors, uh, in order before you can shoot would be ideal, but realistically, probably not going to happen yeah seriously and and especially you know at 300 like because with a center fire you don't really have to worry about calculating that stuff until you get out to about 400 yards um and maybe a little bit at three 300 if you're if it's really really windy hmm. but uh at 400 yards you have more time it's like okay i can really work this out and make sure i have the correct information it, with a muzzle loader if you're making those calculations at two and 300 yards, you're really close. And so you might not have all the time in the world to make those adjustments. Um, and so, uh, this, this will the whole purpose of this is to develop a muzzle loader for a uh, spring bear hunt. Mm. And I'm going to be using a call. Um, and so it's going to be hopefully a close encounter, you know, with the bear, but you know, you never know that I want to be, make sure that I'm, I'm consistent at that 300 yard distance. So mm-hmm. are you going to be on foot or are you going to be in a tree stand? I'll be on, I'll be on foot and I think just making stands. So I won't mm-hmm. be like in a tree stand, but I'll set up the call for 40 minutes and, and then go over here and set up the call. I'll probably do a certain amount of glassing as well, mm-hmm. but, uh, definitely going to favor the call just because of the type of hunting. If I had just a, a center fire, like if I had my six, five, I probably would favor glassing a little bit more and I would glass and find one and make a, you know, spot and stock. Mm. Uh, but I think that with the limitations on the range, I think that the, the call is going to be more effective this year. Okay. But Excellent. Well, being out there shooting that gun, I definitely think it will drop a bear quite easily. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, um, did I, did the, did the screenshots I send you, did they have the, uh, foot pounds of energy? I don't think they did. They do not. They do not. Okay. So the, basically the, I can't remember what the muzzle foot pounds of energy is, but the, the 250 grain bullet is going to carry about a thousand foot pounds of energy all the way out to 300 yards. And so a thousand is usually like the, what you want. That's like the cutoff Mm -hmm. for, um, bear and, um, and deer. And so as long as you're making a thousand foot pounds of energy, you're good to go. But it's just Mm -hmm. crazy to see like something moving relatively slow. Our average, our average muzzle velocity was about 2,200 feet feet per second. Yeah. Yeah. It varied around, but that's still, that's pretty slow for 50, but a ton of potential energy still in that bullet. Seriously. Yeah. And I think that, um, for a muzzle loader, and I think it has to do with our elevation. Um, but for a muzzle loader, that's pretty fast. I mean, 2,200 feet per second is like, it's cooking right along, especially for a 50 caliber. Um, But with it now, when you look at like, if you have like a 50 BMG, that's going to be producing significantly different velocities. Right. Right. 22 seems slow in the the center fire world, but in the muzzle loading world, that is pretty quick. It's moving. Yeah. It's, it's scoot, it's scooting right along Mm -hmm. as Merlin would say. (laughs) Um, but yeah, I had that, I think that that, uh, that velocity is going to carry out that, that energy that far. It's just because you have such a huge bullet that's carrying so much weight with it thousand foot pounds is nothing to nothing to joke with i mean in most recommendations most calibers have to meet that as a minimum to even be allowed to hunt with them mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's part of the reason two two three five five six isn't allowed yeah uh, in a lot of areas it loses that energy yeah pretty quickly um but it's just because it's a smaller bullet you know and it's mm-hmm. going faster but it is smaller and so it's not able to carry that same energy at that distance the same inertia right so um so let's colton Talk to me about the Anarchy Outdoors muzzle brake that we tested and, and also the funnel. So we had, we just, a mm-hmm. little context for everybody. We just recently brought on Anarchy Outdoors is, is one of our brands and um, they, I, we did some testing with it and I, I personally was really impressed. Likewise, uh, you know, I put a brake on everything. So having an opportunity to shoot with a muzzle brake was uh, very good mm-hmm. and I was impressed. Uh, I've shot a Magnum charge before and I don't, particularly favor it <laughs> <laughs> i shoot lesser of a charge i tell everybody that on the phone yeah uh, about 110 to 120 grains by weight or excuse me 
by volume, volume. by volume. Yeah. Getting mixed up. <laughs> it's important. By volume is about where I like to cap out. Uh, but we were doing Magnum charges all day long with that muzzle brake, and mm. I had no pain at all. Yeah. No, nothing. It didn't yeah. bug me. Uh, so I was really, it was a blast to shoot, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was impressed. I haven't got to do a ton of testing on the CVA brake to really compare the two. Mm-hmm. Uh, but from what I could tell, gas dispersion was great. That was one of the big factors we noticed right yep. off the bat was the spiral shape of the brake through uh, all of the smoke evenly out, you know, 360 degrees. Uh, and we could see right through it right away. Mm-hmm. Looking through the scope downrange at the target. Uh, and eventually getting comfortable enough not to blink shooting a 50 cal yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the brake on it i could stay on target the entire time and watch the impact yeah mm-hmm. I, I think that's crucial i think that um the anarchy outdoors muzzle brakes is something i've heard a lot about over the last couple of years and i was always a little skeptical because i was like oh you know omni i'm not in general i'm not a huge fan of omniport Likewise. um but I was like, you know, they're they're popular. I mean, everybody talks about the Anarchy Outdoors muzzle brake, and so I tested them, and uh, very easy to install, mm-hmm. excellent smoke dispersion, and excellent recoil reduction. So there's not really much else you can ask out of a out of a muzzle brake. Right. I mean, that's exactly what you're looking for with it. Being that it's self timed, I think that's a really nice feature with it mm-hmm. uh, because it did get a little gummy towards the end of the day. Yeah. Had a lot of powder residue in it. Uh, being that you don't have to deal with an Allen to time it, you can just thread it off, drop it in a part soaker, and yep. then when it's all clean, tighten it back on, and you're good to go. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it also, um, I think that the uh, it's titanium. That's what that's what I'm trying to mm. remember. It's been a long day. I was <laughs> I was out at the range early this morning, so I was, I'm a little, a little vacant in one my of the, mind. One of the best materials in gun work. Titanium. Titanium, yeah. Titanium is uh, it's extremely lightweight and durable. And um, so, Magnetic. I mean, really when you hold, like when you're just holding the muzzle brake, it just feels almost like nothing. Mm. And so mm. that's a really nice thing is, you know, because what we were talking about with Nate the other day, like ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain. Yes, so. <laughs> absolutely. That's the that's the methodology behind carrying light. Yep. Mm-hmm. So um, that, that was a huge factor. Um, I think as far as just general recoil reduction, um, I think that uh, this. I think that the CVA brake does reduce recoil a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just that's just a pure shoulder test. I have. I don't have any of the data behind right. that. Just in my experience, um, and so I think that if you're looking just for straight recoil reduction, the CVA brake does do it a little bit better. But I do think that the CVA brake is a little more difficult to install. It is e- pretty easy because you have just the Allen key, but more difficult to get more difficult to get and is a little bit more um a little bit more bulky and so there's mm-hmm. there's you know there's pros and cons to both of them um mm-hmm. but actually after uh testing with the anarchy break i am much I, I was pleasantly surprised that it was really really good so yeah you'll be pleased with any break you put on a gun yeah <laughs> it's yeah. gonna take away some of the recoil i would agree omni breaks by design even on some of my center fire guns don't reduce as much as like a, a three and six o'clock port mm-hmm you mean not? You mean nine and three o'clock, right? Mm-hmm. Or three and nine o'clock. Yeah, your yeah. your left and right ports. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your left. Mm-hmm. I was like, three and six. I was like, because because I guess they make three and six o'clock, right? Mm-hmm. Depending. Be- yeah, certain breaks will will if you're a right-handed shooter or left-handed shooter, you can get certain setups. Oh, interesting. Huh. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. I did, you learn something new every day. So, um, so the Anarchy Outdoors funnel, another mm. another key thing. So the funnel, I think, was uh, th- I don't want spin forever here but the funnel was excellent because you're able to it doesn't bunch up at all it just poured straight down which saves you time there was zero powder cling that Mm -hmm. was one of the things we noticed as we would dump the powder down i even tried to overflow the funnel by by speed dumping the entire tube into it zero residue and zero cling there was no static uh none of the granules hung onto it it almost was like it was a slip and slide Mm -hmm. for the powder yeah yeah Mm -hmm. it was it was pretty cool um and so let's see we talked about the environmental factors uh pyrodex select Mm. hunter and i talked about this a little bit on a recent podcast but uh pyrodex select as compared to some of the other powders that you've shot um definitely dirtier Mm -hmm. dirtier than some of the other powders i've shot however no trouble going off we had zero hang fires Mm -hmm. uh you know easy to pour out of the bottle etc just like any other powder velocity wise i i I read a lot of the data that we have on the website there Mm -hmm. and that powder has been tested years ago uh, and proven still to produce extremely high velocities for what it is you do get that dirtier trade-off 
Uh, but if you're wanting something that's going to be extremely fast and you know velocity equals energy in your bullets, mm -hmm. I think Pyrodex Select is great. I recommend it highly to a lot of the folks I chat with on the phone. Yeah, and I think availability is the key thing there. Um, you can find it. And <laughs> I think that in my experience, the standard deviations are going to be a little bit higher with Pyrodex Select, but it's going to be pretty close. And um, you might find that you even match or in some cases exceed the velocity with Pyrodex Select that you would with Blackhorn 209. Right. Yep, we've seen that. So, yeah, I mean, very impressed with that powder. And I think that... Uh, Honestly, I have no concerns using that. You know, and I think that it's mm -hmm. going to be, it, and when you compare it to just like true black powder, like Go X or, or Schutzen or Swiss or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it's not any dirtier than those powders. Um, and I believe that it is still less corrosive than those powders. So, mm. uh, being a synthetic. Yep. Yeah. And so it, it's going to, now don't take that and run with it. It is still going to, you, know, you still want to make sure you're cleaning your guns. Yes. Always, just, always clean your guns. Yes. It is still going to be corrosive, but it is not like to the same level as as true black powder is. Right. I think I think we focus a lot on what's the best uh, anymore. And mm -hmm. Blackhorn two hundred nine by far is very popular. It's very clean, very user friendly. But other powders still work. I mm -hmm. think that's a really important detail. Pyrodex Select, you know, uh, in particular, produces extremely high velocities, sometimes boasting faster speeds than Blackhorn two hundred nine. So it's still a great powder. Yeah. I'm sure, you have to swab a little more, but. If you're looking for something to hunt and your season's really important to you, this stuff works great. Totally. Yeah. And I think another thing that we, we did a review on, uh, I guess we didn't, we didn't do a review, but we tested the, uh, the, the new Thor solvent. Yes. And uh, tell, talk to me about that, Colton. I was impressed uh, for, for something that doesn't look like much. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like soapy water to me. Um, two, two swabs through that barrel. And that crud ring that we had been building up as rough as we could get it was gone. Yeah. The barrel looked brand new. And, I mean, that's some of the best solvent I've seen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's it's very, very good. And mm -hmm. um, so, and also, like, the uh, the part soakers, pre-soaked patches, all that kind of stuff is is coming from Thor. And that it's all it all uses that same solvent. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is definitely one of the best solvents I've ever used. Right. Uh, you it made just, note of that out at the range and yeah i just can't talk i can't talk it up highly enough <laughs> <laughs> for what it is yes it does a phenomenal job mm -hmm. I, i'm actually wanting to try it on some of my center fires see yeah. how it does i'm sure it'll i'm sure it'll do just fine mm -hmm. one of the things i noticed about it too is that it actually causes uh the carbon it's like i had uh, some carbon build up on actually so what happens is you'll get carbon build up on the bottom of the scope mm. and so that comes from just the ignition and everything and some of the blowback and uh, so I had some on there and I just like took a, a patch and kind of wetted down the bottom of the scope, trying to clean some of that off. And after, you know, 10, 15 minutes, it, the carbon actually started to like crust over and like flake off. Oh, and I was like, I'd never seen that before. Those are just, it was so cool. And I was like, Oh man, could just, you blow it away? Yeah. I don't think you could quite blow it away. You had to kind of like peel it off, but it was, it was interesting how it just kind of like started to crust up and like peel mm. off. And I thought at first I was like, Oh no, like is something coming off the scope? I was like, right. Oh, it's just the carbon. Just the carbon peeling off hmm. there. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what chemical compound does that, but its cleaning qualities were great. Yeah, I mean, totally. That's I'm going to recommend it highly now after testing it. Yeah, seriously. So, um, I think, let's see here. I don't think there's much else to cover. I think the one last thing I wanted to cover is the environmentals. Mm -hmm. um, and just make sure we reiterate, reiterate that a little bit more because I wanted to state what we were able to determine with that specific load, and if you're shooting 45 and, uh, you know, or 40 or whatever caliber you're shooting, uh, check out a different different podcast because this one's going to be specifically for, like, this setup that we're using. Um, but if you want just general loaded load development advice, I'll link above our load development podcast, and uh, uh, Nate and I talked at length about that one. Uh, and so, um, but this one in particular, about five miles per hour equal to whole mill. Uh, of adjustment and just like to summarize five miles per hour equal to a whole adjustment uh, a whole mill of adjustment at, at 300 yards thereabouts um you had about we were finding that it was closer to like it was like 4.4 mils of adjustment uh up but i actually after looking at the calculators and doing some more retrospective thinking i think that the 2.78 that we got afterward i think that is the more accurate adjustment at that distance mm -hmm. so 2.78 mils of adjustment of elevation in general at 300 yards um, average velocity of 2,200 feet per second with the Pyrodex Select. 
Um, and so those are kind of just some of the, the general numbers that, that, uh, I wanted to point out to everybody so that you can kind of work from there. Um, your, your numbers are going to be different no matter what you're doing because your elevation is going to be different, all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's what we were able to find at Mm -hmm. our place. So using a 250 grain Thor one size lightning bullet. Yes. Yes. Um, so Colton, let's talk about your next range day. What muzzleloaders would you like to shoot on your next range day? Hmm. The how to pistol. The how to pistol. <laughs> how do you do? Mm-hmm. Uh, the under hammer. That's, that's Nate's joke. That's Nate's joke. I can't believe I said that. Mm. He's starting to rub Shame. off on me. <laughs> <laughs> As in general, I have a no puns allowed thing on the podcast that Nate violates all the time, <laughs> and so. But now, now I'm now I'm dad, doing. He can it. do yeah. those dad jokes. Man. I know. I know. He can get away with it. <laughs> I would love to get hands on with the forty cal HTR. Yeah. Uh, every time we get them in, they go out just about as fast as we can get them. Yep. Uh, so if we could do some long range testing with that, I'd like to experience it with a muzzle brake, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing is a huge different. That one, when you get to the super magnums, it's especially noticeable with the muzzle brake because, mm-hmm. um, what, in, what ends up happening is you have, uh, so much extra powder and you're creating so much more pressure and a lot more recoil. Uh, and mm-hmm. it's like, I thought, you know, you think a magnum charge and just like an Acura or, you know, a Vortec is, is, is difficult to manage, but like when you have, you know, a, a super magnum charge in a paramount, it is mm-hmm. like a whole nother level. And so the, the, um, muzzle brake becomes a lot more of a necessity because, um, with the muzzle brake, in my experience with the HTR, I was able to shoot pretty much all day and not even have like the, you know, like the jitters you get. Mm-hmm. And then I, at the very end, I took the muzzle brake off and shot, shot 10 shots. I think, mm. I think it was 10, maybe it was even five. But after just a couple of shots, it was like, oh, my goodness. Like, it was just rattling you. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, one of those would be great. Yeah. But we might have to push it out further than 300 yards. Yeah. Yeah. To get the, to get the full experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to get some steel targets and uh, go out in the woods somewhere and shoot that one. I yeah. think that'll be fun. We could do it. We could try and push it to 1,000. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, think it's, it. I think it's possible. Oh. I think it's possible. Okay. I'll take your word for it. We'll see. I don't know. Mm-hmm. We'll find out. <laughs> but getting in some of these these newer guns, I really want to get hands on with uh, some of like the Pietas when they come in. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Because the we're bringing on the Pietas and those are those are really cool. I'm excited to get already my getting hands a lot of those. calls about them. Yeah, mm-hmm. steel framed revolvers. Yep, highly recommend. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Cool. Um, well, is there anything else you wanted to chat about, Colton? I was really yeah, actually the okay. the Thor bullet in particular because. Doing all the sizing with Thor, there's a lot of legwork uh, in getting things sized up. And one of the things I notice in particular with CVA guns is they're generally really tight barreled. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Meaning, if it's advertised as a 50 cal uh, and you were to mic it, it's usually right on the money or just a hair bigger, maybe by a thousandths. And that's pretty common. Uh, those Thor one sizes can run a little big uh, in comparison. Mm-hmm. I think generally, if you were to measure it, it's like a 5025 or upwards of a 503 mm-hmm. i thought it would be incredibly difficult to load into a cva gun yeah uh, knowing we were shooting the lightnings but it wasn't sure you had to do a little bit of a woggle to get it started but i had zero trouble with mm-hmm. just holding the the muzzle with my off hand and using the rod with my primary hand i didn't have to jump on it or anything like that and it it stayed consistent the entire day even if we fouled the barrel a little bit yeah so i mean shootability of those one sizes was great uh, they're not a one size fits all. It's a one size bullet, uh, which is an important detail that mm-hmm. I have to differentiate. Uh, and you know, I'm impressed with Thor in general, but I see that those one sizes have a uh, a very a very particular way about them. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm trying to find my words here. But yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> If you're looking for something quick that's incredibly efficient because the Thors have great expansion, mm-hmm. uh, as well as they drop an animal right there. Most animals don't run when Seriously. they're hit by a Thor. Yeah, <laughs> I can attest to that mm-hmm. personally. <laughs> <laughs> Heard countless stories, had countless uh, photos sent in of Thor bullets being recovered and losing almost no grainage. If you're looking for something real quick that you want to hunt with, say, Colorado, it's a great option mm-hmm. uh, because there's not a lot of options, or even California because it's a all-copper bullet. Yep, it's legal in 49 of the 50 states. Yeah of stinking idaho <laughs> <laughs> lead bullets pure, only. Yep. pure lead rule <laughs> <laughs> exactly so it's a great option yeah. i was really impressed with it and i would recommend it more often now than than doing all the legwork and getting the custom size mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i totally agree i think that uh i've talked about thor a lot on this podcast on the 
on past podcasts. And I think that, uh, you know, Thor is just an incredible bullet. Mm -hmm. So, um, cool. Well, I appreciate you joining us today, Colton. Uh, if you guys have any, like any questions or if you're looking for, uh, just more content on our day, I will link above the, um, the video we did, uh, like the, like the actual load development video. And, uh, you can click that link and then also, Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, leave qu co ugh, leave questions you have in the comments. And uh, if you're listening on the audio platforms, make sure to leave a review because that's going to help get our content in the hands of the people that need it. And, uh, yeah, we'll see or, you on the next episode. Or if you have some real technical questions, just give me a call at 855-236-5000. Yeah, and you can talk to Colton specifically. So Get me on the phone. <laughs> awesome. So we'll talk to you later. Bye.